The following program is brought to you by Element 14, the electronics community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com slash presents. It works! It works! Yes! <laughs> Amazing hacks. Inspired designs. Each week, Element 14 Presents brings you innovative projects using electronics, engineering, and more. Welcome back to Element 14 Presents. I'm Clem, and in this video, we are finally going to revisit my experimental resin-based 3D printer. That machine was huge, mainly because the only suitable screen that I could get was a 4K monitor in 60 by 40 centimeters. So that got a huge build volume and the machine's principle, replacing FEP foil with a liquid, is destined to be used for big build volumes, much bigger than you could realize with FEP foil. So in this video, we're building a second iteration of that machine, but I'm taking that concept and I'm putting it upside down. The screen is not dirty. This is the vet of my giant 3D printer. A huge build volume. But I also understood that having such a big surface, it's very difficult to get smooth coverage, even light. Everything gets more complicated the bigger the surface gets. To avoid these complications, I scale the build volume not in X and Y, but in Z. So I take whatever screen I could get that is suitable for my application, but then make a very long Z axis that you could extend indefinitely if you want to print very tall objects. And tall could necessarily also be wide or long, whatever you would want. And because it's based on a screen or a projecting unit to be exact, you basically could get bigger screens for more money, taller z-axis and scale the unit that way. So we are building the small version of a machine that could be very, very big. Most resin-based 3D printers that you get at a consumer level take the build platform and pull out the object from the surface, so to speak. But big commercial machines from previous generations usually had a resin filled tank and lowered the build plate into it. So you would always cure the most uppermost layer and lift or lower your build plate step by step to create the object. And that implies a big problem because to fill your build volume, you would need lots and lots of resin and resin is really expensive. It cures in that chamber. So if something gets wrong, you basically lose a lot of money and consumers could not afford to fill two liters of resin into a vat for a single print, then pour it out again and get another color. That's just not worth it. But if I can suspend a layer of resin, that is the, the layer that's actively printed on a liquid that is inert, that doesn't react with that resin, but supports it. You could get away with the same amount of resin that you would put in an FEP foil based machine, but have the principle of the big laser driven machines, but could also use a cheaper exposure unit. So that sounds like a plan. Let's see what parts we need to accomplish that. As with the previous model, I want to use Nano DLP as the control software for my project. So I'm running that on a Raspberry Pi 4. And the previous version I used the Pi 3 because the homepage stated that it does not support the Pi 4 yet. Turns out the current build I'm using 2770 does run on the Raspberry Pi 4. This is the 4 GB model. If you can get the 8 GB model, the very newest one, then you should be able to have faster slicing times because that uses a lot of RAM and that's where the 8 GB model is handy if you can afford it. But it will 
run no problem on the 2GB or the 4GB version. To power the project, I have some switch mode power supplies. This is the 5V one. I also need a 12V power supply for my stepper motor, but this time I will not need a 36V version because I'm not using the high power LEDs that most uh, commercial printers use. I use a different kind of resin that is easier to float. Therefore, I also need to adapt my exposure unit and I'm using a daylight resin so I can use LEDs with daylight spectrum. And turns out some suitable LEDs are built into commonly available LCD touch screens or regular LCD screens. My biggest challenge now is to find screens that are suitable for the project. Let's give it some trial and error. I've searched through tons of data sheets to see an indication of the wavelength that some LED backlights of common screens would give me and I couldn't find anything. The only thing that some of them provide is, yes, it's daylight spectrum or something that preserves color, but no indication of the real light spectrum. In the end, it's basically trial and error. So I'm using a Midas screen and also the official Raspberry Pi display with the key reason that that one is a screen that works perfectly with the Raspberry Pi and also with Nano DLP. And it's uh, the screen that everybody out there should be able to get. Every 3D printer has to move. In a case of a resin-based 3D printer, only the Z-axis moves, so I need only one stepper motor. And because I only have one stepper motor, I want that one to be reliable, reproducible, easy to get, easy to configure, and basically a good quality stepper motor. So I chose a Nanotech Nemo 17, classic form factor like you would find on almost all 3D printers. And I'm using a TMC2208 stepper motor driver because that is a very low noise, very reliable driver that's easy to control. Of course, we need a way to get the signal from the Raspberry Pi GPIO to the stepper driver and to the motor. And the easiest way to get a project that involves stepper motors and a Raspberry Pi up and running is the Maya Moves dev kit. I've used that in previous videos, exactly the first version of this 3D printer and also my Mac Pro cheese grater. Link is in the description if you want to see those episodes. Those show you a little bit more about that dev kit and what it does. Uh, you can get it if you want. So that's for me the easiest way to get stepper motors up and running. Basically what they do, they interface uh, with the driver. I configure these pins in Nano DLP so the software knows what to engage and it's easily configurable for different styles of driver. So you don't have to use the exact same drivers like I do, but you can just copy my settings if you want. I've linked them also down below. So there's a link to the community where you find all the stuff that I mentioned and can download it for free. Of course, I also need a lot of wires and a micro switch for the end stop. In this case, I won't mount the end stop directly on the machine in a fixed position. I want to be manually determining where's the zero point. So the printer gets leveled every time it's uh, activated by setting the z-axis and then tilting it side to side to use the gravity to make a level surface and just aligning that with the build plate by tilting the whole machine. In theory, that should be a lot easier than my previous attempt. Speaking of previous attempt, that was a lot of CAD design. This one is even more. I have to make a custom vet, a custom mechanical construction. Let's dive into Fusion 360 and look at all these files, print them out, test them, laser cut a lot of parts, test assemble the first iteration of that machine and see if the mechanical design even works. Want to build the project in this episode? Want to download the code? Find the parts list? Want to ask a specific question and know this host will answer it? Simply take out your phone and point your camera at this QR code. This will take you right to all the details you need to get started. 
We'll see you on the Element 14 community. I read all the responses on our videos and especially on the Element 14 community page for each video where people post their insights and their ideas for our project, especially this 3D printer project had got a lot of great contributions from the community. So I tried to take many of them in and I tried to simplify the design as much as possible. So I'm using roller bearings on 2020 extrusion, but it turns out that is not good enough for this application, mainly because I got the wrong extrusion. These roller bearings are meant to be used with V-slot and I got T-slot. That's wrong and that will never run smoothly. But even with the correct uh, extrusions, I doubt that it will be rattle-free. So I'm redesigning everything to fit some uh, standard linear bearings, do a next iteration, also stiffen up some components I need to laser cut the vet again to make sure it is completely watertight. Test that again and again to make sure it withstands the pressure needed. So I need to construct a new mount for my LCD because I had a little accident during assembly and testing. And I basically ripped out the cables of the Midas screen and broke it. So that was the best screen I could find for the application. Uh, given that I don't get a lot of delivery now in these special times, but I also got the Raspberry Pi 7 inch touchscreen, which also cured. It was not as good as the Midas screen, but let's make this work. So I'm printing a new screen mount, put all the components inside that. So that gives me an opportunity to rewire and rethink the mechanical design of that. So it won't slide up and down but go from to the side to make room for the build platform to remove prints that should make it in theory easier to remove the vet and when that is all assembled i hope we can do the first test print so before we can do the first test print with that machine we have to talk about the liquid that is suspending the resin so what I'm using here is photocentric high tensile daylight resin. That's a special kind of resin, not the run of the mill stuff that you would use in those base uh, cheap 3D printers that you find on the internet nowadays. So they use strictly UV light, but this type of resin is dedicated for photocentric's own machines that have daylight LEDs in them with a very specific spectrum. So that's a special kind of resin. And I also noticed that it has a lower density than the other kinds of resin. So in the past, basically the liquid was suspended by surface tension. And if you broke that surface tension, everything was lost. This time I'm able to make a liquid that's solely on density. So the liquid just floats because of its buoyancy. And the way to do that is a very strict secret, but I tell you anyway. So don't tell anybody, but all you have to do is make, uh, how do you call that? Uh, Übersättigte Lösung in German. I don't know how that's called in English. Uh, like a completely satisfied solution. Basically you rack up the density until something can't get dissolved anymore. Uh, the easiest way to do that plain salt and that makes the unit very dangerous because as you know salt water is highly conductive and that is the reason why all the electronics especially the power supplies are up on top of the printer so in case there's any leak the salt water will go down and all the electronics are up there and will not get wet safety third kits i can only guess what values i need to set in the slicer to get this thing to work. So I had a little bit trouble configuring because NanoDLP expects a differently built machine, but with a little tweaking and a little modifications, uh, it worked quite fine. You can download my profile on the Element 14 community page linked below. That's also where you find all the stuff that I mentioned in the videos and get the files for download. 
Now it's time to try out the first test run. It's very important that you have to float the resin as carefully as possible so it doesn't get anywhere where it shouldn't. It also tends to clump into a ball so you need to spread it out to get coverage and you have a minimal layer thickness of about two centimeters to avoid it forming just a huge bowl. So when the resin is in we can start the first test print and I'm really excited. I consider this a full success if I can print something that looks vaguely like the shape I entered into the slicer. Because that proves the principle is okay and all from there is tweaking the settings and the exposure unit. So uh, the screen and whatever print settings you use for that specific resin. Behold the very first 3D print out of this machine. So that is what I consider a 3D print. Do you remember the very first resin or FDM prints that were made by Rapper machines? That's not that far apart. So of course this looks terrible for a 3D print, but it has the general shape. So the principle works. That ridging is just over curing. Also, you can see the features that I put in are basically there, but it's totally over cured. Of course, I used 50 seconds and 20 seconds. So 50 seconds for the first few layers and 20 seconds for the following ones to make sure it really cures. And it does. But also what you can see is that we've got a lot of stray light. And that is because the Raspberry Pi screen is not masking correctly. If you look at a screen and it's totally black when it's on, that means it's good masking for TFT or LCD screens, that is. But if it's like grayish or like flickering, or you can see that it's got um, lighter and darker portions, that means it's not masking as good. The Mida screen was a lot better at masking, but yeah, I broke that, my fault. So, while it's not the best exposure unit, the principle works. So all that the generations of these machines have to do is find the right settings for the right resins and get better exposure units. And for scaling it up and making it bigger, it might be advisable to either use big high quality screens or going to projectors. I'm thinking about more in the projector way. But that's up to everybody because this 3D printer, this project is, as you know, the Clem and it's completely open source and free. So you can use that uh, apart from the Nano DLP software that's not uh, open source, but the principle is the same. You can do that with any other 3D printer software that controls a resin printer. So if you want to make your own version and improve on that one, go for it. The only condition is keep it open source as much as possible and call it a Clem because I also want to be a printer. This is the Clem version 2, my resin-based experimental 3D printer. I know a lot of people expected it to be even bigger than the other machine, but just keep in mind you only have to enlengthen the Z-axis to make it bigger or use a bigger screen. So that's totally scalable. And now it's up to you to make something out of it, like with the RepRap project iterate, innovate, and enjoy 3D printing. Would you like to see more machinery for makers? Do you have a lot of ideas that you could do to this resin-based machine? How would you make it better? Is there any particular screen that you would recommend? Let us know on the Element 14 community. I gotta go, there's another project waiting for me.